We are delighted to open um, the ISS as we have done formally this morning, but it can't really be properly open until we've heard from our first scientist speaker. Um, and we're absolutely delighted to be joined this morning by Professor Howard Wilson uh, from the University of York in the UK. Um, and Professor Wilson is the director of the York Plasma Institute. Um, Professor Wilson has so many, so many achievements. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, I know you've been working in theoretical plasma physics for at least 18 years now. Um, I'm not going to read out all of uh, Professor Wils Wilson's many accomplishments because I'd like to give more time for the science today, but I'm sure that you're going to get to know him uh, very well over the course of the ISS. And I encourage you during this talk to start thinking about some questions for Professor Wilson, which you'll either have time to ask straight after the lecture, or if we're a bit short on time, you can store them up for over lunch or this afternoon or in the days to come but it's always good to have at least one question per lecture to think about something you'd really like to know more about. Um, so without further ado, I'll, inter I'll introduce Professor Howard Wilson formally, um, who's going to deliver the opening lecture on the future of energy from nuclear fusion. Um, and I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to Professor Wilkin Wil uh, Wilson this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, can you hear me okay? I, I can hear myself pretty loud, so I'm guessing you can. Um, so time is going to be tight. Uh, I've been asked to try and do this in under an hour, and it was probably quite a bit over an hour when I prepared it. Um, so if we don't have time for questions, I'm afraid you've got me back again this afternoon, and we can always start the afternoon with, with questions on this morning, um, if like we don't that. get through them all um, this morning. So my role over the next hour or so is to tell you about fusion energy. Um, the conditions that we need to recreate to make fusion work, to create fusion energy, and the approaches that we use to create those conditions. What I'm not going to talk to you about, because I'm going to assume you know, uh, is the need for something like fusion energy. That is the need for sustainable sources of energy without emitting carbon, low waste, uh, et cetera, but also secure energy supply. Uh, we've seen particularly in the last few years uh, how important it is that each country, all countries, have their own um, secure source of energy. And fusion energy can do both of those things. It can provide you with a sustainable energy supply with no carbon emissions. Uh, and in principle, it can provide you with uh, an energy source which is secure. Okay, so this is what I'm going to go through. Um, uh, I will start by telling you what is fusion energy, where do we get the energy from, what is that, that scientific reaction um, that we're going to exploit. We will then look at the conditions that are required to make fusion happen, and we'll find those conditions are really very challenging, to give you a picture of how challenging they are. We do have a working fusion power plant. We call it the sun. Uh, it's not a very efficient fusion power plant. You can imagine how extreme the conditions are in the sun, and you can imagine the challenges associated with putting the sun in a box. Um, actually, the conditions we have to achieve here on Earth are much more extreme than in the sun, because the sun is actually a very inefficient fusion reactor, very inefficient fusion power plant. Good job, otherwise it would have long since burnt all its fuel up and we wouldn't have um, the sun that we enjoy today. Um, so. The conditions are really extreme, and we will look at the conditions that we have to uh, achieve, and we'll try and quantify those. We will then look at the different approaches that we have to achieving those conditions, and there are a number of different approaches that are being explored at the moment. I wouldn't like to guess which one at this stage will be the most successful. I know which is what the one which is the most advanced, and that's something called a tokamak, and that's what I'll focus mainly on today after introducing the range of ones that we look at. Uh, and I'll look and I'll describe to you what that status is of, of the uh, of the tokamak and then look to the future, uh, the future of fusion. Where are we going before closing with a summary? We'll see how much of that we get through in an hour. So what's the process? So you may or may not be familiar with a figure like this. Have you seen figures like this? It shows what we call the nuclear binding energy um, of the uh, uh, of individual elements, atoms. So you know that all of your things that you're made out of are made out of atoms, and the atom at the center has a tiny little nucleus associated with it. And that nucleus has additional particles in it that are bound together within that nucleus called protons, 
our neutrons. And the number of protons in that nu nucleus tells you which element it is. Going all the way from hydrogen, which is at this end of, the, uh, of, that, of that, that figure, uh, the low mass end, hydrogen, just one proton, going right up to big heavy things like uranium or uranium-235, which 235 tells you it has a, a number of protons and a number of neutrons. Neutrons, the other um, um, particle that exists in the, in the nucleus, uh, and together they give the chemistry of that element and the nuclear physics of that, uh, of that element. And what this figure shows you is the amount of energy per nucleon. So a nucleon is either a proton or a, or a, uh, or a neutron. It's a collective name for protons and, and, and neutrons. This tells you the amount of energy that's needed per nucleon to create that, um, uh, that nucleus or the binding energy. And what you'll see is there's a maximum in this, uh, in this uh, figure. I'm going to use this cursor because I don't like you, but I can't see this red dot, but that's probably because I'm 60 and you're not. Um, so the top of here, that this is the most stable element, iron. Anything heavier than iron, if you split it apart, so big uranium, if you split it apart, create two lighter things, that those two lighter things are further up, up, the, uh, up this figure, and so that will release energy. And that's fission, that's conventional nuclear power relies on, on fission. Anything lighter than iron, if you can push it together and create something heavier, you also move up in the energy per nucleon. So that also releases energy, and that's fusion. And that's what we want to talk about uh, today. Now, fusion and fission, really similar words, but they're actually opposite forms of nuclear. They're both nuclear energy, but they're actually opposite approaches to release energy. And we're going to focus on fusion, taking these light elements, joining them together, making something he heavier, and releasing that, 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 that power. Why is it difficult? Well, basically, these two nuclei have to come together and pretty much touch the two nuclei. And they're both, those two nuclei are both positively charged. Positive charges don't like to come together. And that's, that's the challenge, getting them to come so cl close enough together to fuse, such that the nuclear force binds them together into a heavier nucleus and overcomes that Coulomb repulsion, what we call the Coulomb repulsion, associated with the electric charges of the, of the two particles. That's what we're trying to do. Sounds simple, but it's not. And it very rapidly goes from something which is a very simple um, sort of high school thing of keeping two positive charges apart to a very complex piece of science and engineering. So let's, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on, on this region down here at the bottom of the, uh, uh, at the, bottom of the, uh, the low end of the mass thing. So I'm just going to zoom in on that. And I'm going to look at one particular reaction. And it's between something called deuterium which is just a heavy form of hydrogen. You've probably all heard of heavy water. And all heavy water is you take your hydrogen, which is in your H2O, and you make it deuterium. And deuterium, hydrogen, of course, is just one proton. You could even call hydrogen proton, if you like, if it was just a nucleus. Um, so hydrogen is one proton. Deuterium is chemically identically the same as hydrogen. It also has one proton associated with it, and that's what gives it its chemistry. But you add to that a, nu a neutron. And so it becomes a heavier nucleus, and hence, when it goes into water, we call it heavy, uh, heavy water. And so that's the first element that we're going to look at, du um, uh, deuterium. And we're going to react that with something even heavier form of hydrogen. So these are called isotopes when they're chemically the same as, when they have chemically the same um, uh, properties, but they're different mass. They're called isotopes. So deuterium and tritium are two isotopes of hydrogen. Deuterium, one neutron extra on top of the proton. Tritium, two neutrons extra on top of the proton. And we're going to react those two things together, deuterium and tritium. And you can see they sit down here, I've called them H here, H2, to emphasize it's, a, it's an isotope of hydrogen, deuterium. And H3 is the isotope of, of tritium. And we're going to bond those together, make them come close enough. And if you can make them come close enough together, you get helium, uh, uh, which is here. And you can see that's got a big spike. So now you can start to see why we're interested in this thing, because it's, helium's got a big uh, uh, binding energy per nucleus. Uh, per, um, uh, per, per nucleon, um, and a neutron, okay, a single neutron uh, comes flying out. And if you add your protons and neutrons before, and you add your protons and neutrons um, afterwards, you'll see you've got two protons, three neutrons before, two protons, three neutrons afterwards. So that's the reaction we're mainly going to talk about today. How much energy do we get out? Well, I'm going to take my, my deuterium here, which is one MeV, an MeV is a form of energy, it's a measure of energy. It's actually the energy, if you take an electron and you apply one volt to that electron 
a potential of difference of one volt, that electron will accelerate through that one volt. And in accelerating through that one volt, it gains kinetic energy. The kinetic energy it gains in going through one volt, one electron going through one volt is the electron volt. Okay, we'll quantify it in numbers in a minute, but that gives you an idea of why it's an energy. M just means mega, so 10 to the six, a million. So this is millions of electron volts up here. So this deuterium um, here has got one um, MeV per nucleon, but there's two nucleons, one proton and one neutron. And so we end up with two MeVs for that one. Tritium here sits with just short of three-ish, three-ish uh, MeV per, per nucleon, uh, but there's three of them. And so we get nine MeV. Helium, seven MeV per nucleon, but there are four nucleons, so there's 28. Of course, there's no binding energy associated with neutron because it's already split into its element, uh, its parts. And so you can see we start off um, with two plus nine, 11 MeV, and we end up with a binding energy of 28 MeV. There is 17, actually 17.6 MeV has gone missing. And that's the, that's the 17.6 MeV that gets converted into energy. And it's that energy that we want to tap into, that energy that's released in that, um, uh, in that reaction. And we'll get a sense for how big that is in a moment. This, that energy is in the kinetic energy of these two particles. So you take your deuterium and you take your tritium and you bring them close enough together. They fuse and they form helium and neutron. And that helium and those neutrons, they fly out of that reaction with a huge amount of kinetic energy because this 17.6 MeV is released in the kinetic energy of those particles. So they come flying out with very, very high energy. Because of the ratio of masses, so uh, of, the, of the total mass, the, the helium has, has got four nucleons, but a proton and neutron are about the same mass. Uh, helium's got uh, four, of the, four, four fifths of the mass, the neutron's got one fifth of the total mass. So the helium carries one fifth of the fusion energy. So one fifth of this 17.6 MeV. So three and a half MeV is carried by this, this helium. So it's a very energetic um, uh, particle. It's going at a speed of about 10 million meters per second. And when a helium nucleus that's going very fast, we just call it an alpha particle. That's all an alpha particle means is a helium nucleus going very fast. Um, and so we call that an alpha particle. 10 million meters per second, how fast is that? Well, let me take a helium alpha particle, and I'm going to throw it at 10 million, 10 million meters per second this direction. I turn around four seconds later, it goes right around the world and I catch it. It goes around the world in about four seconds. These things are shifting. They're going really energetically. The neutron is going even faster because it's got four fifths of the, uh, of the fusion energy. So it's got 14 MeV and it's lighter. So this neutron is, is really shifting. So these things have got a lot of energy associated with them. And we want to, so first of all, we want to make that reaction happen. And then we need to get that kinetic energy out of those particles and convert them either to heat or to electricity or what we're interested in. So this is the reaction we talked about, deuterium, tritium, going to helium uh, and, a new, uh, and a neutron. That's nice because it gives you a lot of energy. It's also nice because it's actually the easiest fusion reaction to happen. It has got a downside though, and the downside is the production of this neutron. This neutron comes flying out and you've got to build your your system, your containment system out of some sort of materials. And that neutron is gonna come flying out of your fuel and embed itself in the materials of the, of the, uh, that you build the, the, the power plant out, out of. And that's the thing that creates the waste. Nothing is waste free, but it's a, wa it's a low level waste. Anything you can think of, we do produce waste, whether it's wind, whether it's solar, whether it's fission, whether it's fusion, you will always produce waste. Always ask, where does the waste, when somebody tells you it's clean, that's where the waste is, because there will always be something left over. Um, and this is where the waste is with fusion, the dominant part of the waste with fusion, is you get activated components out of, the, out of the materials that you build your fusion plant out of. But that is a low level of, of, of waste and relatively short-lived, about 100 years. You don't get any of the long-lived um, uh, activated waste that you get from fission, for example. So it's a relatively low, a low level waste. Now, there are other reactions that people are looking at that don't produce the neutron. And the nice thing about that, if you don't produce the neutron, you don't have this fast particle that doesn't then um, uh, activate the materials uh, that you build the power plant out of, and the level of waste could be lower. And your materials um, uh, have less of a, a load on them. So it's easier to design your materials to, to um, contain this um, system. Um, one, for example, is proton boron uh, fusion. So you take, you take a, a hydrogen proton and you take your boron nucleus, and that gives you three alphas. And 
Not as much energy, you see, but it gives you a reasonable amount of energy. And there's no neutrons. The challenge is, this is, this, this is hard to do, as we're going to see. We can't do it yet. Um, uh, not, not commercially. Uh, not in a commercially viable way. This is even harder to do. My, my view is we do this first, we get this working, and then we look at these. But there are companies, even private companies, that are looking at this as a, as a, as a, as a, um, uh, a viable fusion power plant in the future. One of these companies is called Trialpha, basically because the reaction produces three alphas. So I'm not going to mention it anymore other than to say there are those other reactions available, but we're going to focus mainly on this deuterium, or almost exclusively on this deuterium tritium reaction. So what do we have to do to make this reaction happen? I've already tried to explain to you that it's hard and we're gonna quantify how hard it is in a moment. Um, if we wanna build a system to, um, uh, to make this reaction happen, what does that system have to do? Well, first of all, we're gonna find this, these have to be at incredibly high temperatures. If you want these things to come close together, one way to do, one way to do it is just to accelerate them. Imagine yourself on a bike trying to get up here. You're in one valley and you want to get over to the next valley and there's this hill between. The faster you can get yourself going in one valley to go up the hill, the easier it is. Um, you can get up over the hill and down into the, into the next valley. And that's kind of what you're trying to do in, in, in getting this fusion reaction. You've got, you're sitting in a valley with your two charged particles um, uh, a certain distance apart. And you want those particles to come together. As you push the particles together, it's like trying to get over the hill. But if you can get them close enough together, the energy, they will, they will bond into a new state that's of lower energy. And so that's like getting over the hill and then into this lower energy state. You've got to get over that hill into this promised land of, of, of um, uh, bountiful energy uh, on the other side in the other valley. So you, you've got to put enough energy in to get over that, that hill. And the way we put that energy in is just to make it hot. We just increase the temperature. So you know that if I start heating the gas in this room, the nitrogen and the oxygen in this room, the, the particles are just jiggle, are, are jiggling around. They, they're, they're jiggling around all over the place. And the hotter they are, the faster they jiggle. Okay. And so if I hit the, heat them to really, really high temperatures, they can, in principle, go so fast that they'll overcome their Coulomb repulsion and fuse. So we've got to create the conditions that will that will um uh we've got to manage those conditions create and manage those conditions at these really high temperatures as i say we'll come we'll we'll quantify them in a moment you then have to capture this neutron this is where we have the energy that we want to tap into to create to turn into electricity etc so you've got to capture that neutron so you need a system to grab it but not just get its energy out this deut deuterium it sounds exotic but actually, there is tons and tons and tons of deuterium in the world. One in every 6,000 hydrogens is actually deuterium. And you might think, well, one in 6,000 isn't very many, but just think of all the H2O there is in the world. There is just absolutely tons of deuterium in the world. So that's not an issue. And the reason there's loads of it is it's stable. It's a stable isotope of, of hydrogen. Tritium is not stable, and it will decay with a half-life of 12, 12 or so years. So it was probably made in the Big Bang, but the Big Bang was a lot more than 12 years ago, so it's long since decayed away. Now, it's constantly being made by cosmic rays, etc. So there is some, but it's really rare. So we have to make it. You catch it from some, you, you, you have a supply from somewhere, and we can talk about that, to start your reaction going. But once it's going, you have to make that tritium. And the way we do that is we take this neutron and we react it with something called lithium, which again is bountiful. We'll look at that in a moment. And so this neutron has to do two things. It provides the energy that we're interested in, and it's going to provide the tritium to keep this reaction going. Um, so we've got to convert that energy from the neutron into a useful form. That's pretty conventional, to be honest. Uh, you, you're basically going to tap, tap into the, um, the energy of the neutron. You're going to heat something up, and then you're treating your fusion power plant as just a big kettle. It's just going to boil water, drive, make steam, drive turbines. That's the simplest way. If you can think of some other clever way of doing it, that would be great because that process is pretty inefficient. Um, but it is a tried and tested process, of course. Uh, and so that's what we have in mind for the first power plants at the moment. We have to understand and manage this waste. Now, the nice thing about the waste that's produced in a fusion reactor is it's all to do with what you make your reactor out of, what materials you choose. So the things that make steel different to iron is relatively trace levels of, of impurities. Now, you saw iron sat at the top of that, that that um, uh, binding energy per nucleon. So it's actually quite hard to activate iron. It does, ha it does have um, uh, radioactive isotopes associated with, but, but they last like five or 10 minutes. So you activate your iron, five or 10 minutes later, it's fine. 
So iron itself, you're not too worried about. It wouldn't produce significant levels of waste in the fusion plants. But steel, the thing that makes steel different to iron is trace levels of impurities, things like nickel, nickel cadmium, uh, et cetera, that you just put very, very percentage levels, sub-percentage levels that go in there, and it fundamentally changes the property of your iron, which is quite brittle. Hit, hit iron with a hammer, it shatters. Hit steel with a hammer, or some steels with a hammer, it doesn't shatter. And it's because of these, these trace levels of impurities. Now, those trace levels of impurities, they're the things that get activated by the neutron. And so if you can de design clever steels, low activation steels, where you choose the, 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 these trace levels of materials that go into the iron, give your material its structural properties and functional properties that you want, but don't have the activation, then you're in business. And so although you do get waste out of fusion, it's only associated with what you build your plant out of. And there's the, prospe the prospect for clever, clever material scientists to continuously reduce that level of waste that's produced. And already there are low activation steels that we imagine using in the first fusion power plants. Let me move on. So let's have a look at a cartoon. Let's build up the, 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 the fusion energy, um, the, the system that we're going to, to look at. So this is the reaction that I've said we're going to look at. We're going to take tritium. We're going to take deuterium, uh, and we're going to react that, uh, and we're going to react those together to give us a neutron, a helium, and power out. And you'll see why I've written it in that that unconventional way in a moment. So deuterium, as I said, is plentiful. There's loads of it in the world. We're not worried about the the de uh, deuterium or getting a supply of deuterium. Supply of deuterium. We are worried about the tritium. We have to make that. And to make it, we take the neutron and we act, react it with lithium. And you've all got lithium in your pockets now. Uh, it's a standard material in um, rechargeable batteries. So again, there is loads of it in the world. Um, so we're going to take that neutron and we're going to react it with lithium. And that reaction produces the tritium plus more helium and power out. And so the, the net products of this are just helium. Actually, it's quite quite a useful commodity, helium, so it's not a waste at all. We want helium. So if you can get it out of this reaction commercially, it's, that's a good thing. But don't forget, I will have waste associated with what I build the reaction out of, which isn't shown in this, uh, in this figure. So actually, although the, the reaction we're looking at is tritium and deuterium, they're not the raw fuels. The raw fuels that we need to take from our Earth are deuterium and lithium. Why have I... Put these two pictures there. Well, there's a stand. This gives you an, an idea of how much fuel there is in the world. If I take the deuterium out of half a bathful of water, and I take the lithium in a standard laptop battery, and is and instead of having a bath and you, and and building a, a, a rechargeable battery, I could do fusion with them. That would provide me with all my lifetime's electricity needs. That's all the fuel that I need. I'd have to be a little bit careful. I'd have to. Um, conserve my energy a little bit. And so you can see there's absolutely loads of fuel uh, available for this, uh, uh, for this um, process. We have to contain the whole system. So this is what I, when I talk about fusion power plants, it would have all of this within it. So that's why it's all the contain, containment. The deuterium and the tritium, as they have to be really high temperatures. And that, in that, in these high temperatures, they are in a plasma form. We'll talk about plasmas in a moment. The lithium, we embed within a blanket, and you have, this is a really fancy piece of technology. I've deliberately put a little dotted line around there and said blanket, but this is one of the most technically challenging things that there is in a fusion power plant because it's got these neutrons blasting into it all the time, and it has to have these neutrons blasting into it all the time, otherwise it's not going to react with the lithium. And so designing this blanket is a really fancy piece of engineering uh, and technology and chemistry, actually. Um, and so you have this blanket to produce your fuel and to take the heat out of uh, out of your system. And then that gives you your products, your electricity or other products like heat. You might use the heat directly. It's very inefficient to produce electricity actually, but clean at least once you've done it. So there are benefits. It's safe. We're going to see how hard it is produced to produce fusion. If anything goes wrong, the conditions are not right for fusion. It just goes out. It's inherently safe. It just switches off uh, if something goes wrong. We've already seen there's no greenhouse gas emissions, so it may, it, we can tick the box off of, of, of not contributing to uh, uh, global warming. It can operate whenever we switch it on, if we knew how to switch it on. Uh, it can operate whenever we switch it on, and so it 
if it's dark, you can still do it. If the wind's not shining, you can, if the wind's not shining, if the wind's not blowing, you can still operate it. So it's a good, steady base load supply, which will underpin solar and wind. Energy is so, I'm not saying that we're not, we don't need solar and wind, we absolutely do. Energy is so important that we need every single piece of sustain, every single chance that we've got of producing sustainable energy, we have to take it. Uh, and we've got to take them. So we need a whole portfolio of solutions to go and address the energy problem. Uh, fusion does come with particular benefits. Got abundant fuel, as I've, as I've said, and it's got relatively low waste, as I've, uh, as I've said already. So I've talked about the conditions and, and how challenging it is to produce those conditions. So let's now try and quantify what those are. So I'm going to move more into a bit, a bit of science now. And I, I don't have many equations. I'm a theoretical physicist, so excuse me if I have a few. Um, but this is one that I'm going to build up. I'm going to talk you through it, okay? So there are three things that we have to achieve in order to deliver fusion power. One is the density. So think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to get these, these particles to come close enough together that they will fuse, okay? So they're going to collide into each other and produce a fusion reaction. The more dense your fuel, the more of it is in a certain volume, the, more, the bigger the chance they're going to hit a deuterium is going to hit a tritium and produce fusion. If you've got all deuterium and no tritium, there's no chance of it happened, happening. If you've got all tritium and no deuterium, there's no chance of it happening. And actually, the optimum is to have an equal amount of deuterium and tritium. But actually, it's quite a broad optimum. So you find that your fusion power down here is proportional to your density of deuterium and your density of tritium. Okay. And if you Say that you have a density of ND plus NT, you'll see that this is maximized when there's a 50-50 mix of deuterium and tritium. So that's number one. That's an easy one to picture. You just need a high density of fuel in your system, and then it, and then it will produce, uh, then it will, that, that's one, one of the things you need to produce fusion. The next one is we've got to overcome this Coulomb uh, repulsion. So we're going to make our particles go really fast so that they um, slam into each other with a high energy, get over the Coulomb barrier, and fuse. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to put, we're going to heat the fuel to very high temperatures. We're going to use this unit. So I talked about MEV, mega electron volts, so millions of electron volts. We're going to use a, 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 a measure of temperature in plasmas, uh, which is kilo electron volts. So one kilo electron volts, that's a thousand electron volts, one kilo electron volts is about 12 million Kelvin. So you can already start to see the kind of temperatures we're going to talk about. So if we talk about KVs, it's a nice order one number, we're talking about 10 million Kelvin. That's about the temperature at the center of the sun. What I'm showing here is something called reactivity. So this reactivity is if, I, if these two deuterium and tritium do come close enough together, what is the chance that you get a fusion reaction and they don't just bounce off each other? That's the reactivity, okay? So this is like a probability that the reaction will happen. And I'm plotting this up here. It's on a logarithmic scale. So notice that each one of these, they're small numbers, first of all. Fusion's hard to happen. Uh, so this is 10 to the minus 24, 10 to the minus 23, 10 to the minus 22. So these are factors of 10. And you get absolutely nothing until you get above a KV, until you get above 10 million Kelvin. Pretty big temperatures. But the DT has a maximum. And clearly, we want to go for the maximum. We want to get as much fusion power out of this as possible at about 20 KV. 20 kV is about 200 million degrees centigrade, 10 times the temperature of the center of the sun. Hold that in your head for, for the time being, because we're going to come back to that temperature. Here's a couple of other, other reactions. You can get just deuterium, deuterium fusion reactions, or you can get deuterium helium-3 reactions, but you can see how much lower the reactivity is. It's a factor of 10 below in terms of reactivity compared to the DT, and that's why we're going for DT, why DT is the easiest. It's not easy, but it's easiest to happen. So we need a temperature of about 200 million um, degrees centigrade. Um, so that now gives us the chance that fusion will happen. We then, to get the power, each time a reaction happens, we get the energy um, uh, produced uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the reaction. And we're characterizing it here with the energy of the, of the alpha particles, the helium. And then the bigger the volume, the more stuff you have, the more, the more um, fusion power you get out of, out of the thing. So, this is the fusion power. So we need a certain density and a certain temperature. I said three things, so we're going to come back to the third in a minute. First of all, I want to take a little aside to the loop of my life, the field that I've been working in for the last 40 years um, uh, is plasma, 40 plus years, whoops, uh, is plasma. Uh, and at fusion temperatures, 
100 million degrees, pretty much everything would be in the plasma states. What happens when you're in plasma states? So I think an easy way to, to think about it is to think about water and the three, the, what you know is the three states of matter of water. You've got the solid state, which is ice. You apply energy to the solid state, i.e. you heat it, it melts and you get the liquid state, uh, water. And then as you heat that, you get the gaseous state, steam. Now keep heating it. So you've got your H2O molecules and I heat that up. Those H2O molecules will go faster and faster and faster and they'll bash into each other more and more. They will split those molecules. You'll split those molecules. You'll get individual hydrogen atoms, individual oxygen atoms. They're going faster and faster and bashing into each other. Suddenly your electrons will now start to boil off your nucleus. Your, uh, off. So your atoms will no longer be neutral things. So an atom is a nu neutral thing, but it's made of a positive nucleus and this sea of electrons around it I'm now going to boil those, effectively boil those electrons off that nucleus. Now what I've got is an ionized gas, where I've got a whole load of positive charges and a whole load of negative charges. They feel each other, but the negative charges are no longer bound to a particular positive charge. They're no longer bound to a nucleus as it would be in an atom. That state, you can imagine the individual particles in that state interact with each other in a very different way to the way the neutral molecules in this gas are interacting with each other. In the, in the gas uh, uh, in this room, they have to physically hit each other before they know that there's another molecule uh, in its vicinity. If you have charged particles, a positive charge here, for example, and a positive or negative charge here, they know about each other straight away from the, from the Coulomb force, even without getting close to each other. There's a little bit more to it than that, and that's the fun of plasma physics. But the this gives you the fourth state of matter. And we say it's a fourth state of matter because it behaves so differently, has very different physics properties to a neutral gas. And it's amazing. Get into plasmas. If you take nothing away from this, get into plasmas. This shows you how cool it is. So plasmas are actually pretty rare on Earth. At least natural plasmas are pretty rare on Earth. A lot of our plasmas are, are made by us humans, um, often for technological applications, not just fusion, lighting, for example. A lot of industrial process, all your chips uh, are made through plasma processing. Uh, a lot of things, pretty much everything probably in this room has been through a plasma at some stage to either give it a coating, change its functional forms, etc. They're low temperature plasmas, they're only a few thousand Kelvin. Um, but if you go up, up, into the, um, uh, up into space, pretty much everything up there in astrophysics is in the plasma state. So this is the sun. The sun is our, uh, our local fusion reactor, uh, and it is in a plasma state, and it's a magnetized plasma, actually. There's, mag there's magnetic field associated with it. And you can see all these rich structures here, these filaments that come flying out from the surface of the sun, see all the swirls and things in here. You wouldn't get those if this was a neutral, uh, a, a neutral gas. You only get them because it's a plasma. And plasmas can carry loads of different waves. They do carry a sound wave, the same as the wave you're listening to, to, to me now but a whole load of other ways because of the different ways the particles can interact with each other and interact with the electromagnetic fields. Okay, so I've done two. I've done density and temperature. And I said there were three things. The third thing is the energy confinement time, tau e. And I'm going to define that in a moment. It's basically a measure of how effectively your system is to contain to your plasma. Um, uh, it's how leaky that, that system is, how much energy leaks out through your system. Uh, is the energy confinement time. But I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And if I take my density, my temperature, and my confinement time, I multiply them together. It's a product of three things. And so we imaginatively call it the triple product. And this is the fusion triple product. And it's a key parameter for understanding how close we are to fusion conditions, commercial fusion conditions. So what is the confinement time? Let me give you a physical uh, a physical. Um, uh, analogy. And let me talk about the confinement time of water in a bucket. Rather than talking about confinement time of energy in a plasma, let me go to water in a bucket. If I have a bucket of water and I neglect evaporation, that has an, in a, uh, an infinite water confinement time. That water will stay there forever. However, if I drill holes in my bucket, that water will leak away. It will seep out through the holes. The more holes I drill, the faster the water will leak. And the water confinement time is the time taken for about half of the water to go out through the holes. So the more holes I drill into my bucket, the more leaky my bucket, the faster the water leaks out, and so the shorter the confinement time. There's another interesting thing, though, which is important for fusion, is that also the leakier the bucket, 
the bigger the mess I make on the floor, the more water there is that I have to clean up. Similar thing in a fusion plant, and it's one of the challenges that, that we have. I'll come back to that in a moment. Note that's not the same. The energy, the, the water confinement time is not the same as how long I can hold the water in the bucket for, provided I have a source for water. So if I pour water in at the top, I can keep, as long as I pour the water in at the same rate that it comes out through the holes, I can keep that water level at that level for as long as I'm pouring water in at the top. So I could have this water hold, hold, held here for, I don't know, 10 minutes, 10 hours, three days, however, however long I keep the water going for. My water confinement time, though, is not. It's the time, if I were to switch this tap off, it's the time taken for half the water to leak out. It's a measure of how many holes there are in there. So they're very different things. So the water confinement time might be three or four seconds for a certain bucket, but I might be able to keep the water in there for ages. So now what's that analogy with a, a fusion system? Well, for a fusion system, let's now think instead of level of water, we're gonna think of the thermal energy in the plasma. So you've got your thermal energy in the plasma, you're applying heat to that, to that plasma to, to keep it in your fusion conditions. And the amount of heat in that plasma is like your water level. You have heating systems driving that, that, that plasma to keep it, uh, to keep it hot. Um, but your system is not perfect at keeping that energy in. It will be a leaky system. And so that heat will leak out. The heat will leak out at a rate, which is the energy confinement time. Typical fusion, at least magnetic confinement fusion plants, that confinement time is about a second. But you can operate a fusion plant for an hour, two hours, because you keep the heat going in for longer from your external heating systems. There's a formal definition of the confinement time. It's just the stored thermal energy in the plasma divided by the rate of loss of the power. Okay, just keep that in your head. You've just got tau is W over P because we're going to rearrange that in a moment. And now look to start building up what a fusion plant will look like with a cartoon. So here's my box. I'm not going to say how I'm going to hold that D and that deuterium and tritium at the moment. So here's a box with my deuterium and tritium in. And I'm going to apply a whole load of external heating power. It's PX going into that box to keep this, to keep this um, hot. It won't be a perfect system. And just like the water comes out the hole, uh, out the holes in the bucket, that some of that heat will escape. And so we'll come out and the amount of heat will escape is just a rearrangement of that equation that I showed you on the previous slide. It was just said tau was W over P. I've now rewritten it, that P loss is W over tau because I'm going to control how much W I've got, how much stored energy that I've got, and I will have a system with a certain tau. This tells me how much energy is coming out. And that is exhausted heat. Everything that I, anything that I put in here will leak out, and I have to manage that. And so the shorter this confinement time, the, sorry, the, the, yeah, the shorter this confinement time, the smaller this is, the bigger this is, and the more heat I have to manage coming out of the system. That's not all though, in my little energy loop, because I'm gonna create fusion power. And so I have this fusion power is also produced. That fusion power, four fifths goes into neutrons. And I like that, it goes into commercial products and it goes into tritium generation to, to, uh, uh, to put back in as fuel. But one fifth stays as the alpha particle. And I've not mentioned the alpha particle yet, but remember an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. So that is charged, the neutron, has got no charge with it. It doesn't really interact with things very well, the neutron. It just goes flying through most things. You've got loads flying through you now, and they're not interacting with you, with you, so you don't know about them. Um, the helium, though, is charged, and so it does get, it does interact with things. If you, if you have helium, it would get maybe a, a few microns into your skin, and that would be it. You can't go very deep. They interact with things very well. And so actually, the helium is trapped within the fuel, and it's very energetic because it's, it's got a fifth of the, of the fusion power. And so we can take that helium and we can put that helium, that helium energy, as it collides with the deuterium and tritium, it will keep the deuterium and tritium hot. And that's a good thing because that means we can turn down our external heating. And of course, if we want to build commercial fusion plants, we don't want to put heat in, we want to get heat out. And so we can turn this down um, depend, to a level depending on how much fusion power we produce and how much helium will go back into heating our deuterium and tritium. That's our closed system that we want to try and uh, generate. This gives you the idea of a fusion gain, Q. Okay, so this is something we talk about quite a lot in fusion, it's the big Q, and you'll see it in press releases about fusion, the, the Q that's produced. That's something called the Lawson criterion. So Q just looks at how much power we are applying, so what we have to put in with our external systems, and how much fusion energy is produced. 
And it's just the ratio of the two. So the fusion power out compared to the power that you're putting in. If you want to build a, a commercial plant, there is no point in having less fusion power than power going in to make the reaction. That's not a good commercial prospect for anybody. You want more fusion power than you put in to create the reaction in the first place. So you want Q to be much bigger than one. That's why this is one reason why Q is quite important. It's also important from a scientific point of view, and we can talk about that later. What, why is Q such a, so important from a science point of view? Now think about this reaction. Wouldn't it be cool if we could switch this off? Wouldn't it be cool if the, if the heliums themselves, the alpha particles themselves, had sufficient energy, if you're making enough of these, that, you, that it could keep the deuterium and the tritium in the conditions required for fusion, and then we can just switch this off. And that's called ignition. It's just like chemical ignition. So if you have a fire, you can imagine you've got your damp wood there, for example, and you've got a, you've got a, um, a um, uh, oh, what's the word? Not Bunsen burner, gas torch, yeah, a gas, a, a gas um, a torch on it. While I'm holding the gas torch there, I can make that wood burn. But if it's damp wood and I take the gas torch away, then it it would just go out. Okay, that would, we'd call that a burning situation where you're having to apply heat to keep it burning. We call that a burning plasma. However, if you can take your your gas your your, your gas burner away and the wood keeps burning, that's ignited. You don't need any additional input power to, to make it go. And so this is like my gas, gas heater, my gas, my, my blow, blow torch. That's the word I was looking for. This is like my blow torch. Um, if I take it away and it keeps going, that's ignition. And that's Q of infinity because this has gone to zero. And there is a condition required to get Q of, uh, of infinity. And that's when this triple product, N, T, tau, is bigger than this number. Now, don't worry too much about the units or what the number is. Just notice it's 10 to the 21, and 10 to the 21 in anything is a big thing. So this is a big number that you're trying to achieve to make, make fusion happen. So let's look at some of the approaches to fusion energy. How, how long do you want me to talk for, Chris? Have I got another 20 minutes or so? Yeah. yeah? OK, so approaches to fusion energy. There are two broad approaches. Um, our aim is to get this triple product close to this ignition criterion, the so-called Lawson criterion. And there are two broad approaches to doing it. Magnetic confinement fusion, where we contain the deuterium and tritium fuel for using magnetic fields. Okay, that's what, that's what magnetic confinement means. You're confining the plasma with magnetic fields. So you're containing the DT fuel using magnetic fields. You have a relatively low density, but magnetic fields are actually not bad at keeping your energy in. So you have relatively long confinement times. You might not think they're long, but seconds is okay, we go for seconds. And, and so we have confinement time about seconds, relatively low density, and you can just, and, and then temperature, we're aiming for an optimum temperature basically. Um, and then you can imagine getting towards these numbers with a low density, high confinement time. Inertial fusion is exactly the opposite. Inertial fusion, you take a small pellet about this size of frozen deuterium and tritium, and you compress it down. You compress it down by a factor of a thousand. It's like taking a brick. You all know what Lego is? I think Lego's international, isn't it? So it's like taking a brick, a regular brick that you build a building out of, and squashing it down to the size of a Lego brick. I don't mean chopping bits off. I just mean squeezing it down. Taking a solid and squeezing it down to something that's about a, a, a thousandth of its um, volume. And that is what you do in inertial confinement. So this density is absolutely huge. But the confinement time is, is very small. It's billionths of a second, nanoseconds, billionths of a second. And those two, so the N tau in inertial, uh, inertial confinement fusion and the N tau in magnetic confinement fusion, the aim is similar in both, but the approach is different. Low density, long confinement time in magnetic, high density, short confinement time in inertial. Let's look at each of those processes in a bit more detail. I'll start with inertial confinement fusion. I'm not an expert in inertial confinement fusion, but I, I can tell you a bit about it. So I said you, you have a, a frozen mix of deuterium tritium. This is very simplistic. These things cost about ten thousand pounds, dollars, etc., uh, um, twenty thousand Australian dollars, I guess, to produce. They're, they're really expensive to produce. Um, so you take a, about a two millimeter spherical frozen shell of deuterium tritium. You put something heavy around it, typically a carbon-based, plastic-based um, uh, um, uh, shell around it, 
and you hit it with the world's biggest lasers, for example, something called a driver, but lasers uh, are often what's used. And you hit this from all sides with these with these um, high power lasers, highest power lasers in the world. This um, shell then ablates off, and you know about rocket action. You know is it if 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 it, if something pushes uh, pushes off, it's going to push against something. So as this shell pushes off, it pushes off against the the DT fuel. As it as it gets heated by the lasers, it ablates off and it pushes back the DT fuel, and it's that that compresses down to really high densities. As it compresses down, just like when you pump your bike tire up, your, your pump gets hot. This just, this all, that's because of the higher pressure. This also gets hot because you're pushing it down to very, very high densities. But here the densities are so high, that this thing gets really hot uh, and actually starts to approach fusion conditions right in the very center of that pellet. But if you can get the fusion conditions to happen right in the center of that pellet, you then start to get your alpha particles produced, your energetic helium particles, and they come out and they will collide with the cooler DT outside that and heat up that cooler DT so that it also now becomes fusion conditions and starts to produce its alpha, alpha particles, which go out and heat another shell outside that. So you get this sort of like burn wave, as we call it, propagating out over billionths of a second, so really, really quickly, um, uh, propagating out through that, through that shell until a large fraction of it burns, uh, through the uh, through the, the deep sea reaction, you get your neutrons, of course, are flying out all over the place at the same time as the alphas. And if those neutrons again, you capture, great tritium, and um, uh, and, and get your energy out. This is NIF, uh, and you see the size of it from this person in here. I said it was a two millimeter, a millimeter or so pellet. That millimeter or so pellet sits in the center of this big chamber. You have big lasers. In the case of NIF, 192 of the world's most powerful lasers focuses on in on this poor little shivering pellet in the middle, waiting to get hit by these 192 lasers. In 2020, NIF stands for the National Ignition Facility. So it's a bold name. They wanted to achieve ignition. Okay, if you put it into your title, you better make sure you do it. Um, they've struggled for the last 10, 15, 20 years to get ignition. They still haven't got ignition, but actually in 2022, they got world record um, uh, amounts of energy for the energy that goes in. So they've got three megajoules out of fusion energy for two megajoules that goes into the pellet. Don't confuse that with the, with the energy that you take off the grid to power these 192 lasers. These things are really inefficient. So this is not commercially viable yet. And the, you know, the, the directors of this program will tell you that this is, and this is important scientifically because we've never had plasmas in these conditions before where, you, where you're dominated with the, uh, um, uh, uh, by the alpha heating, the alpha particle heating, but they're a long way off commercial commercial fusion energy yet because of the inefficiency of these laser uh, systems. The other approach is magnetic confinement fusion. So let's build up the picture of magnetic confinement fusion. So here's my magnetic field. So I've got a magnetic field pointing in this direction. Any charged particle can freely flow along magnetic field lines, but try and make a charged particle go across a magnetic field line and it can't. It can only go around in a circle. So if I have a magnetic field lines going in this direction, charged particles can only spiral around it like this. And Chris tells me I'm not allowed to go any further. Than that. <laughs> they can only spiral around it. Okay. So, so with this system, the, 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 uh, 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 a cylindrical system, you can see that if I now squeeze my magnetic field lines together, my, these charged particles spiraling around here, my deuterium and my tritium ions and the electrons, because they're in there as well, and they're an important part of the mix, but of course they don't fuse but they're in there, um, they contribute to the pressure, um, they will be held to these small spirals. This is about, for an iron, this is about two millimeters across, okay? And this might be a meter or so, or half a meter in a, in a typical fusion reaction. So you can imagine putting this in a cylindrical can of some fancy material, and this would keep your, your hot particles away from that, from that can up here and, up and down here. But of course, you're all intelligent, so you go, well, what happens at the ends? It's all just streaming out, and yes, this is a rubbish confinement system. It has a really low energy confinement time. There's no way you can get to ignition. So this doesn't work, okay? But it's the start of something that does work. Let's go a step further now and create what we call a magnetic mirror. So a magnetic mirror, you put coils at the two ends of my, of, of my cylinder and make a higher magnetic field at the two ends. What happens then? So this Lorentz force, as it's called, so it's the Lorentz force which is pulling the particles to go round in a circle. Lorentz force acts perpendicular to the magnetic field. So you imagine your, if you imagine your particle, um, it doesn't feel Lorentz force going along the field when it goes along the field line. But if it tries to go across, 
it feels the force pulling it back into the magnetic field line all the time. Now, if my magnetic field line curls round to get stronger in here, it's got to have a component that does this because magnetic field lines can't end. You can't have a flapping magnetic field line. It's got to keep going until it, until it hits a pole. And so this, so if I want my weak field here to connect to a strong field here, it's got to curl round. And then because this Lorentz force is perpendicular to the field line, during this bit, there's a part of the Lorentz force which pulls it back and pulls it back into the main, main body again. Same this side. If it tries to get out this side, part of the Lorentz force that pulls it back as it gets stronger. It's a consequence of dip B, uh, dip B being zero, which basically says you can't have magnetic field lines flopping around. And so these particles, as they try to get out, a fraction of them come back. But the ones that are going fast enough along the field line compared to across the field line will always escape. And so a fraction of them will always get out. You might say, well, that's okay. I'll lose a few and then I'm, and then I'm done. The trouble is that these particles will collide each other. So here I've got my particles all going in this direction along the magnetic field line um, uh, in a certain way. But those particles will collide with each other and scatter. And so constantly you will be, your particles will be switching V parallel, parallel to the field line and V perp. And so the upshot of it is particles scatter and end up in this so-called lost cone and go out through the thing and get. So again, the confinement time just isn't, it's, it's not short enough to, um, uh, sorry, it's not long enough to uh, uh, give you a, a fusion system. So this also doesn't work. It's still an interesting system. You can create x-rays, for example, um, but it's no good for fusion. So we take our cylinder and we join it up. We bend it round and we make a donut out of it. And one way to do that is to have a set of coils. So these golden rings are my crude effort of, of making a set of um, coils to make a component of the magnetic field, so-called toroidal component of the magnetic field going around this direction. And this is the main confining field of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the plasma. However, if your field is curved, we can talk about it over lunch or uh, if you're interested, but if you have a magnetic field that's curved or varying, radially coming out of here, turns out that your particles still drift out. They still drift out radially outwards in all directions. Both your electrons and your ions actually will drift out. And so still the confinement time is not long enough. I haven't got time to go into the physics of that, but I'll say we can talk about it afterwards. You can take out the effect of those so-called drifts though, if you have another component of the magnetic field going in this direction, okay? So now there's something I want you to remember. This component that goes this way around, this is a torus, this shape. This, this component that goes this way around the torus is called the toroidal field, and it's the biggest one usually. This one that goes this way around the, the, the torus is the poloidal field, okay? And so it's, uh, uh, it's usually smaller, but it's essential to average out the effect of that, uh, of the drift. And so we now need to think of, so with the toroidal field, it's fairly straightforward. You put these big conducting coils there. They could be copper, they could be superconductors. In the future, they will be superconductors. Actually, now they're superconductors quite often. Um, for these toroidal field coils to create the toroidal um, uh, magnetic field. How do we create this poloidal field? Okay, and there are two basic ways of doing it. One is a tokamak and one is a stellarator. Okay, so now let's look at what a tokamak and a stellarator is. Start with a tokamak. Okay, so now the color has changed because I've used somebody else's figure because I can't draw this stuff. Um, so these are my toroidal field coils, these blue ones, creating the toroidal component of the magnetic field that we just talked about. In order to create this poloidal component of the magnetic field, just like the current, a current in these coils creates a toroidal component, a current through the plasma will create a poloidal component. So now I have to make a current go through the plasma. One way I can do that is to have another coil, sorry, getting complicated, another coil, a solenoid actually, through the center. And if I ramp the current in this solenoid, it induces a current in the plasma. Okay, by transformer action. Have you all done transformer action? Or if you're a physicist, you might have done Faraday's law, but basically it's just, it's, it's just transformer action. You're ramping a current through here and you induce a current in the plasma. As you induce a current in the plasma, it creates this poloidal component of the magnetic field. And so your net effect is, so if you imagine a car in a tube, now my magnetic field lines, if it was just, if it was just purely toroidal magnetic field, my magnetic field lines would go around the, the torus like that, but with the poloidal field as well, those magnetic field lines spiral over the surface of the uh, of the tire. If you can imagine that, uh, imagine that system. So that's how we do it with a tokamak. That's a good confinement system. That's what you get up to a second or so with. 
Stellarator is the other way of doing it. And these are getting increasingly attractive these days. So or with Stellarator, all you do is instead of having a nice D-shaped coils like I showed you before, you twist your coils. And as you twist the coils, if you twist them in a certain clever way that clever engineers develop, um, you can create any pitch, what we call the pitch of the field line. So the, the, um, uh, how tight the winding is of the, of, the, of the field as it spirals its way around. You can create anything you like from these coils. So it's actually quite an efficient system. It's, its challenge is in creating these coils. And of course, once you've created the coils, you've frozen it in. With a tokamak, you can change the pitch by changing the current in here. And you can change the current in here by ramping the current in the, in the solenoid at different rates. So to tokamak has some level of flexibility associated with it. Stellarator is relatively inflexible. So you need, a, you need to trust your theoreticians to tell you what pitch of field line you need in here to be optimum, to then design your coils. And that's it. That's what you have to live with, uh, with a Stellarator. But simulations these days are getting pretty good. And so the first experimental data is coming out of a big um, Stellarator called Wendelstein 7X in Germany, um, uh, which is also the most advanced. There's another one in Japan called LHD, which is similar size. Um, data is coming out of those, which will tell us maybe uh, that um, uh, how to optimize these coils. And this may be the way to go. It has a big ad advantage over the tokamak, two big advantages. One is it operates in steady state, because of course the tokamak, you can only operate it while you're ramping the current in the solenoid. Okay, so you can only operate for a certain amount of time, except there is another way of operating a tokamak steady state. And we'll talk about that if you're interested as well. But a stellarator is inherently steady state. You just drive current in these coils. While you're driving current in the coils, it will go. Uh, and it will go for as long as you like. The other thing is that if I lose this plasma in a, in a tokamak, if something goes wrong and the plasma, um, uh, plasma starts to go out, it will tend to shoot up or shoot down in what we call a vertical displacement event. So it is what, it, what the words say. It's a vertical displacement up or down of the plasma. And if it strikes the vessel wall, because all of this is inside a, a vessel to keep it away from the atmosphere. If it strikes the vessel wall, then first of all, this thing's hot. And all of that energy goes into your, that thermal energy goes into your into your materials. So your materials not going to like that. Not the main thing actually. This thing typically has mega amps of current, millions of amps of current flowing through it. Though that current's got to go somewhere, and it flows through the metal objects. And I'm sure you've done calculations um, uh, in your in your studies about the forces of conductors in magnetic fields. Okay, these are all conductors. The, the vessel wall is a conductor suddenly you're flowing millions of amps through a conductor in magnetic fields of Teslas. That's like dropping a jumbo jet on it. That sort of millions of newtons of force on, on these components. So these disruptions are, uh, are a real challenge for future tokamaks. Not today's, but uh, you know, we can manage them with today's tokamaks. They're smaller, but future ones, the bigger fusion ones, they're big issues. Accelerator has no current flowing its plasma. It doesn't need to have a current th flowing through the plasma. And so it's not vulnerable to these so-called disruptions. So there are some pros, some cons. But as I said, the tokamak is the most advanced. Um, and so I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about that. Now, Chris, I've got, a, I've got a proposition for you. I could stop now. We can take questions. And we could just resume this this afternoon instead of doing the, the more physics-y one that I was going to do. Or maybe I could do the more physics-y one afterwards. But I think. I think I don't want to rush it, and I see time's getting on. I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. So should we pause now and come back later? Yeah, yeah, and see how we go. Is, are people happy with that? Is that okay? Okay. The, the best thing comes in come in multiple parts. You know, Indiana Jones, all sorts of things. So, so much like your favorite Netflix show at the moment, we're going to leave on a bit of a cliffhanger for this afternoon, and we're going to move um, to energy of a different scale, so lunchtime, so you can come back feeling uh, really refreshed. But um, as we pause this lecture, could you please join me in thanking Professor Wilson for...